a, a, a cascade. Um, and, and this is gonna be recorded uh, if you want to have a question uh, answered, but you don't want people to see it, then send it directly to Cindy. You can do that. Uh, that's a function uh, of Zoom. So uh, my topic tonight is, are the kids all right? Post-pandemic parenting, but it's not, of course, post-pandemic. It's pandemic, ongoing pandemic parenting. And I'm going to address the worries of parents. Let, let me set the context for you. Um, I, I'd never heard of Zoom on the 8th of March in 2020. I think many of us hadn't been on Zoom. I certainly never imagined myself uh, presenting on Zoom. I was an in-person speaker. If you look over my shoulder, there's a, I still have an old technology, uh, a, a, a year at a glance calendar. And I would write where I was gonna be, where the school I was gonna visit and the parent group I was gonna to talk to. And it was all there on my calendar in March of 2020. And I, it was all canceled because we went into lockdown and no school wanted a speaker or was gonna have a speaker, it wasn't safe. And I ran a wet paper towel over that calendar. My year, the planning was gone. Um, and I wondered what I'd do. Maybe it was an early retirement. And then people began to call and say, would you Zoom with our parents? Would you Zoom with our teachers? And I started accepting invitations and I probably have done, I don't know, I've lost count, over 400 Zoom presentations in the last two years. Um, what was interesting was that because I have a history with international schools, they began to call and the schools in China had uh, gone remote uh, early on, uh, actually in January, Hong Kong International School had gone on uh, remote learning in early January of 2020, two months before um, COVID hit the East Coast of the United States. So I began talking to schools in Asia on Zoom, talking to teachers, talking to upset parents, talking to administrative teams in Vietnam. And I worked my way, so, way across Asia and then I was talking to schools in the Middle East through the Near East South Asia Conference of Overseas International Schools. Many Americans are not aware of how many American led international schools there are in the world, English language, schools led by American educators. It's about 1400 schools. It's a huge, huge network around the world. So I was talking to schools in the Middle East and talking to parents who were in countries that were absolutely locked down um, with extraordinarily strict requirements and then other schools where the governments weren't responsive at all. And there were different fears associated with all those. And then I went across Europe and was talking then to schools in the East Coast in the Midwest and the West Coast. And, and there it was in October of 2020, I started talking to schools in Hawaii who had just been hit by COVID. And I realized I'd gone around the world. I'd chased the virus through schools and, and was back in the Pacific Rim where, where I had started. Um, I've continued talking to schools. As Cindy said, I started this morning with the lower primary teachers at Hong Kong International School, which is an American school actually uh, run by um, the Lutheran um, uh, Archdiocese. And um, the, those American teachers there have not seen their families in two and a half years. Many of them lost parents in the United States uh, to COVID, some, but others had cancer, but they couldn't be with their parents. They couldn't visit them. They can't leave. Hong Kong, uh, they're under the most stringent kind of requirements. There's only a one-way ticket out, but you can't uh, travel and then come back into China in, in any easy way. And it's painful because they love their jobs, but um, uh, their extraordinary requirements. And that has been true uh, of schools all across the United States. And there's been pushback by parents and there's been politics and all of it has led to 
the, some of the most stressful times in schools um, that anybody can remember. And increasingly, people are asking me to talk to parents. Um, because parents have been worried uh, about their kids, about their kids' uh, learning loss, about the rules, about whether requiring elementary school children to wear masks um, might have a long-term detrimental impact. I, I remember one mother in Los Angeles said to me in this most authoritative way, this is sometimes late in 2020, she said, Dr. Thompson, would you tell me the long-term effects of the pandemic on children of different, di different developmental ages? Very specific. She wanted the expert to tell her. And, and here's what I said. It's actually my first pandemic. I don't know a psychologist or a psychiatrist who's gone through a pandemic. I've known some who've worked in war zones. I know some who've worked in countries where there's been genocide, but I, I don't know what the long-term research is on a pandemic because this is all new to us. So there's some questions that research hasn't supplied us answers to. It will. There's intensive research going on the psychological impact um, uh, uh, of the pandemic. And I'm trying to read it in real time and make it accessible to people. But what I wanna talk about is what parents have gone through in the pandemic, no matter where they have been. All of us have had to keep our families safe while constantly thinking about the possibility of disease and death right from the beginning. Or are we gonna lose our aging parents? or I am an aging grandparent. My nine-year-old granddaughter was worried right away that Nana and Pop Pop would die from COVID, would get COVID and die. And we had to talk to her about that. You had to talk to your children about the virus, about safety, about how high the stakes were. And you've had to manage risk for your children for now two years, and you're still talking to your children about risk. And you're still managing risk. And you're still worried about members of your family who have suppressed immune systems, who needed to be protected, even, even now if they were vaccinated and boosted. I mean, the landscape, the public health landscape, the conditions of this virus have changed constantly but it's required parents uh, to come to grips with the reality of death and parents have had to talk to children about death and protect them from the possibility. In the early going, we didn't know whether COVID would attack uh, young children in a more harsh way. Some, uh, I believe the avian flu did. It, it, it hit kids harder than it hit um, adults and certainly, uh, the 1918 uh, a Spanish flu hit young adults. It took down healthy young people faster than anybody. And we didn't know. So we had, to, uh, we had to engage in this kind of protection and we had to explain to our children why we were protecting them in the ways that we were protecting, why their schools were closed, why they were having to uh, pay attention to their teachers in a little box on a screen. And it was really hard. It was hard for them. I believe it was harder for the adults. I talked to some, a couple in Los Angeles and they said that their four and a half year old daughter was uh, obsessed. This is about four or five months into the pandemic, was obsessed with death. She was asking questions about death all the time. And she couldn't get off the topic. And I tried at first to normalize it by saying, between four and a half and five is when children become aware that death is permanent. They're fascinated by a dead squirrel. Um, they're gripped by a pet who dies, a dead fish. Uh, they stamp on ants to test the proposition that death is permanent and they can 
kill something. That's very four and a half to five and a half. And I tried to normalize it. And they said, no, it's not like that. She's on us all the time, all the time uh, uh, about death. She's obsessed. And I said, well, what have you told her about COVID? Have you told her that it's a lethal threat? Oh, they said, no, no, we don't want to talk to a four and a half year old about that. And I said, well, what do you say to her about all everybody wearing masks? And they said, well, it's, we told her it's kind of like Mardi Gras. People are dressing up. I said, well, she's not buying it. <laughs> Your daughter is not buying it. You don't have to give her the complete course in epidemiology and virology but you have to be straight with your children. But it's been sad and it's been hard to have these conversations. And as the months ground by and kids were missing school and missing their friends, these conversations became quite painful and sometimes angry. And kids, there was teenagers particularly uh, angry about the restrictions uh, being locked in with their younger brothers and sisters. Um, and these, these were stressful times for families, but the stakes were so high uh, that as parents, you had to, um, you had to lock down your family and your children had to become remote learners. So as parents were doing this, they began to worry about four things. And I'm gonna touch on these things I hope uh, these resonate for you. Um, uh, 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 parents worried about learning loss. Um, that they thought their children were missing school and wh whether it was elementary or middle of, of school or high school, um, parents worried a lot about what was being missed and were their children going uh, 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 to fall behind. It's questions that educators can answer but you can bet that every district in the country is testing and assessing uh, uh, for learning loss. They need to know so when children came back into school that they could meet them where they were and try and fill in the deficits. The Boston Public Schools lost uh, touch with 40% of their seniors and juniors in that spring of 2020. Kids who, they just lost contact, didn't reconnect many of them with their school experience, that's catastrophic. So we'll talk a little, I'll talk about learning loss, but let me lay out the four. Um, parents worried about the mental health of their children. Were their children going to be traumatized by living through a pandemic and all the restrictions that they had to live by, live under? Parents worried about their children's social lives, their kids' friendships, and whether it would uh, distort or arrest children's development to be so separated, separate from friends or having, or could, when the schools reopened, uh, having to uh, 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 wear masks in school. And it was a universal concern uh, of parents. Um, and, and then as the pandemic wore on, parents were intensely worried uh, about screen addictions um, because children, we were all on screens. Parents were working on screens if they could. They were, that was considered lucky if you could work from home. You didn't have to be a frontline worker. Of course, there were, bless them, people who did go out and look after our health and deliver us groceries and all of the things in the early going. And there's still people whose jobs require them to be out when there are those of us, myself included, who can work a lot uh, through a screen. But parents let their children uh, uh, stay on screens um, much more than they would because kids were learning. They were, that's how they were conducting their social lives and that was their entertainment. And so there are hours and hours on screens and parents worried about that. I'm gonna address all four. Learning loss, um, the mental health of kids, the social lives of children, and, and then screen addictions. Um, I'm hoping 
that I'm meeting you in some of your concerns. Let me talk, because I'm a clinical psychologist, about, um, about mental health of children. Um, the Surgeon General recently released a report saying we, there are concerns about the mental health of children. And when you read it in the media, uh, most people don't read the report. When you read it, um, it, it fits into um, a narrative that uh, all children's mental health have been adversely affected uh, by the pandemic. In fact, I've had people say to me uh, with absolute confidence um, that all children are going to be traumatized by living through this pandemic. And to that, I say, rubbish. Total rubbish, pop psychology. First of all, trauma has meaning to me as a clinical diagnosis for an event like child sexual abuse that so distorts a life or a, a car accident that is traumatic because it's overwhelming and creates high levels of fear. And what I have seen is that parents are using trauma to describe kids being upset, kids being sad, kids being lonely, and kids fighting with their parents. They're all traumatized. Rubbish. Okay? We do not have a generation of traumatized children as a result of this panic, of this pandemic. Why? Because many people in the town of Arlington live in a nice house and have been lucky enough to have money to put food on the table. And so children have lived in the house they have known with parents who love them under restriction, but they've had three meals a day and they've been able to reconnect with their teachers and their parents have moved in to try and enrich their education and their lives have not been, uh, it's, it's not like living in Afghanistan. It's not like living in a war zone. It's not like living in Lebanon in a, in a collapsing society and culture. Um, parents have really strived heroically to make life as good for their kids uh, as possible. So I, I have a dog in this fight. I have three grandchildren in Littleton, New Hampshire, and I'm watching my three grandchildren, nine, seven, and just turned five and watched how they've coped with it. Um, because my grandson, the youngest has vulnerable lungs and spent a lot of time in a neonatal intensive care unit in the first two weeks of his life. His mother was gonna do everything she could to protect him from a disease that might attack his lungs. And so they were very seriously sequestered. And the two girls and the boy got to be a quite tight little tribe and they fight, but they've also played together an enormous amount. He's a lucky guy, his older sisters played with him much more than they would have in normal life. Um, and and it, it's been a good experience. The public schools of Littleton, New Hampshire uh, couldn't connect with kids remotely because many in, in a, a, a relatively resource poor town didn't have laptops or Wi-Fi. So there was no schooling in the spring except to stop by and pick up um, worksheets at the school, but they got a grant from the state of New Hampshire and people got, and they got Chrome books out to people. And there was at least school in person two days. And so I've been tracking my own grandchildren uh, and looking at their mental health. And I remember uh, one day last winter, I called my daughter and she'd been homeschooling her kids pretty much uh, for several days of the week. Um, and it got tiring and she sent them out to play in the yard in the winter and the snow. And I, my granddaughter Aubrey uh, came running up to the iPad to say hi to pop up. And, and I said, I, I hear you, uh, your mom gave you an early recess. How, how, how long have you been playing in the yard? And she said, four hours. 
okay. <laughs> and she, her cheeks were flushed and she was so exuberant and happy and satisfied that her playmates were her, her siblings. And this is not every family. And I'm not holding my grandchildren out as exemplary. There have been down times for everybody. But to, to immediately assume that this was traumatic or that kids couldn't cope, the vast majority of kids, the vast majority of kids have adapted, they've coped, they found their resilience, they managed to learn online, they managed to get their work done, and they did not fall apart. And I hope that's true for your children. There were a minority of kids, some of them who had been anxious or depressed going into the pandemic, some already in therapy, some with anxiety disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder, which makes you focus on germs. And that's a very typical symptom of OCD. And, and in a pandemic, that's, that's a nightmare for a child who has uh, already um, extremely vigilant uh, uh, about disease and death. And there have been kids who've gotten more anxious. There have been kids who've gotten extremely frightened. There have been kids who, I talked to a girl in Atlanta who started her high school in Atlanta. Um, well, she started remotely and she didn't meet any of her teachers at the beginning of high school. And she didn't meet any other ninth graders. And she'd moved out of her middle school and, and started school in the fall of 2020, but she didn't know anybody. And by the time I talked to her in mid-November, she was in trouble. She was depressed. Um, and she just said to me on the phone, you know, I just, it's not going to school when I can't meet my teachers. I can't, it, it, I, I just can't. And she was, she didn't put it in so many words, but she was really suffering from a lack of structure. Luckily, her parents had identified her to the school's counselor. That's one reason why I was on the phone with her. And the counselor was working to connect her with therapy, but everybody knew that what she needed more than anything was to get back into school in person. And most children have not needed psychotherapy. They've needed school. And they've needed their teachers to be back in the classroom. And the mass have been annoying, but being in school was just such a relief. Um, though it was very frightening for teachers. My, my son's a teacher at an independent school in New York City, and he was, um, he taught unvaccinated children. Um, he was a first grade teacher. Uh, and so he had no kids who could be vaccinated, not until this fall. So he taught masked unvaccinated children for a year when he himself uh, was not vaccinated for many of those months. And it was scary to teach kids. And that's caused enormous tensions in schools. It's caused union actions. It's caused in independent schools, it's caused teachers to be fired because they wouldn't come into classrooms. Um, and schools have been roiled and exhausted um, but in the end, and I think you may have heard it, uh, President Biden say this at his press conference yesterday when he was asked about how many schools were closed. And he said, you know, the media is very over-focused on schools that are closed, but 95% of schools are in fact open and are, are operating. And that's what kids needed. So if you read the media, it makes it sound like there is an epidemic of poor mental health from kids. Indeed, a 50% increase in girls appearing at the emergency room with suicidal ideation, girls with uh, thoughts about self-harm. That went up 50%. Well, that's a, that's a huge percentage increase, but it's actually, a, in absolute numbers, a very, very small number of kids and, and not all the data run in one direction. The, 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 the state of California typically in a typical year, tragically has about 1400 
kids in the state of California commit suicide in an average year. And in the year 2020, uh, that number was around 1,200. So in fact, they saw their suicide rate drop. Um, the, the glib assumptions that kids are uh, all suffering from poor mental health or that they've all been traumatized. I, I hope I've, I've, I've put that to rest. And, and now we need to focus on there have been times when kids have been unusually lonely and sad and angry and felt helpless. Of course, haven't we all? But for the most part, I have seen the kids returning to schools and returning to summer camps because uh, I'm involved in the camp world. And many of the day camps in Massachusetts operated in the summer of 2020 and all of the day camps uh, and sleepaway camps operated in the summer of 2021. And there are people calling me and saying, "How? Do, what do we do to get our child ready for camp? And I said, well, you ask them if they're worried about anything and you put them in the car and then you drive them and you drop them off and, and, and let them enjoy camp. And the vast majority of kids who arrived at camps were not in psychological distress. They were just really happy to be away from home with other children and being looked after by uh, uh, counselors who, who could let them play and do things that they loved in the out of doors. And you saw this return of health. I just, uh, earlier this week, I was uh, on a call with, uh, uh, organization that of camp owners and directors in the United States. And they had a great summer with kids last year. What they did have was an enormous number of parents calling anxiously, wondering if their kids were all right at camp. And it was the, the parental anxiety that was the, uh, the, they were getting waves of parental anxiety uh, at these camps, but the kids were, were happy to be back and, and, and enjoying themselves. So if you think um, the Lancet, the British Medical Journal has had a commission studying all of the research around the world on the impact of the pandemic and their conclusion uh, at the end of the first year was that our psychological immune systems were much better than we thought and that the vast majority of kids were resilient. They're continuing to look at it, but that's what I've seen. And so I've made that, uh, that point. Learning loss um, is real. Every uh, superintendent, every principal I've talked to says that there has been some learning loss. It has been particularly catastrophic in inner city school districts that were under-resourced uh, or where the teachers didn't teach. In, in Chicago, the Chicago public school teachers didn't come into the classrooms for a year. And uh, the, the assessments in uh, those uh, struggling urban districts, um, the assessments are bleak and, and many kids have had uh, serious learning loss. It is the, the more, the better resource to town is and, and, and the more um, they've been able to connect with kids uh, in the early going, uh, in, in remote uh, learning, there's been less uh, a learning loss. I do not know the statistics for Arlington, but I'm gonna call on an Arlington educator if she or he is on this Zoom call. I got an Arlington educator. Cindy, do you know something about the learning loss in Arlington? Um, I do know that there is significant learning loss in some areas and the MCAS results showed um, some learning loss in mathematics and not as much in the English language arts. Okay. Okay. I had a principal in, um, in Walnut Creek, California, she said to me, you know, we were able to convey to our elementary school kids, all, all, all the concepts of multiplication. They all know multiplication and 
they know their tables, but they haven't practiced it enough and they're not that good at it. They, they, our teachers distilled down everything and they, 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 they taught the conceptual material, but kids have not had a, a practice. Um, so when it comes to learning loss, um, there, there's been a, a, a loss of repetition, there's been a loss of practice, there's been a loss of enrichment and, and, and fun. And the question is, has it gone on so long that it won't be recoverable? I don't have the answer to that, but I do know as with everything in American education, um, sadly, uh, uh, Peter, people are better off, are able to provide a more enriched environment for their child, and they were able to stem the learning loss and parents uh, living in poorer circumstances uh, didn't have, have the time or the resources uh, to be able to do that. So uh, it, it's hit um, uh, poor families uh, 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 disproportionately. So we've talked about learning loss and we've talked about um, mental health. Parents ask me um, about their kids' social lives. Dr. Thompson, knowing I've written two books about the social lives of children, um, and that's often been my subject at the Otis when, when I spoke, um, uh, Dr. Thompson, won't this destroy kids? Kids won't be able to renew their friendships. They won't be able to. There were a number of parents who, who had a, a fear that this would create children with arrested social development and that they would not uh, somehow be able to pick up. And, and this was something I could address with great force because we are social animals and our brains are completely wired to interact, to play, uh, to touch. Um, kids love to interact with each other and they only want to. And the restrictions of social distancing and masking were very painful for kids. But the moment those are lifted, the moment they are with children in a bubble that their parents created or a pod created, they just begin to play. And, and I saw no evidence that children were somehow losing their underlying uh, 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 social ability. When children return to school um, uh, 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 this year, and at least for the fall, there was, um, you know, there was almost regular schooling. We had, uh, we tested all of our boys at Belmont Hill and we were maskless for six weeks because we, we had so little COVID. We're all back in masks now. But there was a point where Belmont Hill felt normal and the boys looked normal and their relationships looked normal. And they were able to play their sports and they uh, interacted. And you, you, you never had a sense that they had fallen behind socially. And the camp directors said, yes, there were kids who, when they arrived at camp, were, were anxious when they got out of the car and were anxious for two or three hours but we're gradually pulled in to the cabin, the tent, the group, and their behavior was normal and unremarkable in a day. Uh, so this is, human beings are wired to be close and to play with each other. And the, the, the anxieties of parents are sometimes uh, kind of funny to me. I had a father who said he was worried that his 17 year old would get so used to um, sitting and interacting on a screen that he wouldn't want to go back and actually get together with other kids. And I said to him, you know, I think biology uh, takes care of that. Um, he, he will want to be back with other kids in person with their bodies because that's what 17 year olds are, are that's what their neurobiology uh, drives them to do. Uh, and finally, screen addictions. I had so many questions about this because parents were feeling guilty and full of self-reproach and thinking, I, I, you know, I let my middle school boy play many too many video games and stuff like that. My high schooler is just on screens all the time. And I've, I've, it's Liberty Hall and I'll never be able to put the rules back into place. And I, I had the question so many times, I called Michael Rich at the Harvard Medical School, he's a pediatrician, Cindy and Carlene, you might want to get Michael Rich to speak sometime. He has a website called The Mediatrician. Um, and he 
uh, is writing a book about uh, impact of the media. Um, uh, uh, and I called Michael and I said, are you worried about screen addiction? And he said to me, Michael to Michael, he said, Michael, look, you know that there have always been a small sliver of kids whose brain wiring makes them susceptible to screens. They're really gripped and held by screens, but it's a small group of kids. And yes, maybe they are more at risk, but the vast majority of kids, when the time comes and they're able to be with their friends and able to be being playing their sports and seeing their teachers in person, that their screens will go back and take their place in a balanced life, as long as their parents can reassert the rules. But some parents have wanted to re, uh, many parents have asked me, how do I reassert the rules without having fights? <laughs> well, that's not going to happen. Um, uh, because kids don't want a limit uh, 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 on their play or their screens. And, but as a parent, you have to have limits and they have to get sleep. Um, and I was in North Carolina and uh, uh, there were two moms saying they just couldn't control their 14 year old daughter's uh, uh, devices because they'd been through this pandemic and it had been so stressful and so terrible for them. They just didn't want to enforce rules and whenever they tried, their 14 year old daughters said how terrible it was for them. And that completely immobilized these two mothers. And, and they didn't reimpose any rules. So their girls were up all night on their smartphones. So they're, and they said, you know, what do we do? And I said, well, you know, you have to act like a parent. And, and happily, the head of that school volunteered that she had two high school sons and the rule in their house was by 11 at night, two high schoolers, by 11 at night, both of the boys' phones had to be plugged in in the parents' bathroom and both of their laptops had to be plugged in in the parents' bathroom. That was curfew, that was lights out, no devices in the bedroom. And I thought, well, that's nice and clear. I've seen that in boarding schools where the check-in in a boarding school is the kid checks in, but they have to then plug their phone into a column uh, of plugs and plug their laptop in. And there are three, uh, their are attendance taken for the kid and the devices at bedtime. That's just good parenting. So I've addressed um, the things that I came to talk about. I talked longer than I intended. Are there some questions? Only one in chat. Cindy, give it to me. Yes. So um, there is one. Um, I hope it's not too early. This was earlier on to ask Dr. Thompson this. It seems that at least some parents are having difficulty obtaining therapy services for their children and struggling that, that are struggling with anxiety or other mental health issues um, until unless every child who wants or needs therapy can obtain it. What can parents do and what can kids do on their own? Yoga, meditation, deep breathing, other kinds of exercises or activities? Okay, so if you imagine in a town like Arlington that eight or 10% of children of pre-pandemic were battling with anxiety, depression, uh, 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 disorders that make school very tough like ADHD, um, or some, uh, some learning disability with, which might have an emotional um, impact or component uh, to it. Um, and there has been an increase in kids seeking therapy, no question about that. But if, you, if that 8% moves uh, to 14% to of kids, leaving still 86% of kids coping and resilient, which is how I see it, that was enough to overwhelm uh, a therapist and all therapists. I know we, we can't find therapists for, for boys at Belmont Hill, but we don't have an epidemic of boys who need it, but we do have boys 
And it's been very tough to find therapists because they just filled their hours. Um, so uh, what you need to do is first of all, acknowledge your child's distress and have a conversation where you can name it. I see you're anxious. Tell me about that. Are you having a good day or a bad day? And as a parent, you don't wanna do therapy, but you certainly can check in and you can empathize and you can acknowledge. What, what's terrible for kids is that they suffer with something that they think makes them uniquely weird uh, or, or you, defective. And if you can acknowledge their anxiety or acknowledge their sadness, say that they're not the only person in the family who's ever experienced that, that maybe you've been, had anxiety in your life or your partner's had anxiety. Um, so you, you, you normalize it to the family. You don't say it's nothing. Don't, don't do that. And say, we're gonna try and find you a therapist. That's really hard now. Can't, would you mind if I check in with you? And what's tolerable? And most kids will say, don't check in with me. You know, like every hour, mom, <laughs> that'll drive me crazy. Or maybe not every day but you need to develop a, a, a conversation. If you then have the ability to teach some skills like uh, 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 breathing or meditation, but it, it depends on the age of the child. I mean, uh, trying to teach your 16 year old son uh, meditative practice is likely to put him off meditative practice for life. Uh, especially if you push it, push it, push it, push it. So you have to be careful to remain the parent and not try and be the therapist or the full Buddhist uh, meditation teacher. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, particularly with uh, adolescents where it's so easy to become quickly annoying. With younger kids, you can do things like worry books. And if you've got a kid who's worried, you, 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 uh, uh, get a little bound book and, and sit uh, uh, three times a week and, and, and go over their worries and write them down. And then the book can capture and hold some of the worries. You can go back and refer to it. And you can say, was it worse than you had? Oh, it's the same kind of worry you had before. And you can, you can do a little bit of, I'm not going to call it cognitive behavioral therapy, though that's where the roots of it are. But as a parent, you take your child seriously, you develop a language to talk with him about what they're, they're struggling with, and then you find a way, some way to externalize it and to contain it. Um, Michael, the, the next one is more of a statement, but it does lead into a question and the next, the next uh, piece of information in the chat. And, um, one person would just like to know this stuff isn't all past tense. We're still living through a lot of it. And then the next question says, can you provide any thoughts or reflections to help kids deal with resurgences? Even for adults, each new surge can feel more disappointing, especially Terrible. since we can't identify a definite end to the resurges. No. And this is where Living through a pandemic is very like, uh, psychologically, it's like uh, being in a country at war. You know, I've thought about a lot about my parents. I'm 74. My father um, fought in France and was in the army of occupation in Germany. And my brother, my older brother, Peter was conceived just before my father went overseas and he went overseas for two years. And my mother raised a child, a baby on her own not knowing whether her husband would return from World War II. And nobody knew whether they were gonna win World War II. And nobody knew whether, I mean, the people in my family didn't, I had a big family and all my uncles were either in the European theater or the Pacific theater. And everybody in the family worried about their lives and their deaths every day for years. Um, 
and uh, all but one happily came home and one did not. Um, but people, that greatest generation was able to live with uncertainty. Uncertainty um, is hard. And as a parent, you'd like to be able to answer your child's questions and, and promise them something um, that's a bright future. A, a, a bright thing we can do this weekend, a bright thing we can do at Christmas, a bright thing we can do. But as a parent, you're always trying to tell your child, we, we've got control of things and we're gonna make nice things happen for you. And this pandemic has made it impossible for us to say when it's gonna end and whether when life is get back to normal. Now our kids know us very well and they know you're suffering as much as they are. They may deny it at moments, but every child I've talked to has said to me, you know, my parents are at moments a kind of a mess in this pandemic. And, and, and of course they're right because it's hit all of us hard and we've all had moments of discouragement or outright depression or moments of severe anxiety. So what you say to your child is, I wish I could tell you when this is gonna end. I wish I could do that for you because as a parent, you do wish that every day. As a grandparent, I do wish it every day. And so you tell them that's what, what your loving parental heart would like you to be able to do. And then you say, and I can't do it. And it's frustrating as hell. It's driving me crazy that I can't tell you when this thing's gonna end. I want it to end and I know you want it to end. And but we have to continue to be resilient, all of us. How can I help? Um, but, but there's no magical talk about a resurgence. Nobody knows. Anthony Fauci doesn't know. <laughs> he can't tell us when Omicron is gonna end and whether Omicron is gonna defeat all other variants and whether we, we just don't know. Um, somebody, Alex is asking about um, uh, uh, remote learning. Can you read the whole rest of the question to me, Cindy? I can. Um, so there is also somebody, Justin has his hand raised and I'm not sure if we want to get back to him. I, I do. I, I'll talk to Justin and then, then we'll take Alex's question about remote learning. Justin, your hand's up. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. I sure. um, appreciate you making time. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Great. I was wondering if you could clarify, um, you know, what you mentioned about, you know, the commentary about all kids being traumatized. And I know you said that was rubbish. And yes. you said, for example, that this isn't like living in Lebanon and yes. kids in Arlington have a house, three meals yes. a day, have a teacher, and most of them haven't been traumatized. I'm a little concerned about that. And I, I just was wondering if you could clarify. I think there are people in this community that simply due to the pandemic, perhaps have had to move, do not have the economic means to continue to live in this community. Yep. People of color that have had to tell their kids of the history of vaccines in this country. And this specific pandemic has caused this, not OCD from before. Teachers that have been traumatizing to students, including in the Arlington Public Schools, specific to the time frame of this pandemic. So I guess I, I'm, I'm a little confused and I was hoping you could clarify um, because I, I'm concerned about the stigma that can be created for those that might feel like they're in that category and feel like they have to conform to what's a perceived majority. And if they don't conform, then it's just kind of be silent. And I think that exacerbates the trauma that I think is living there, but I respect, you know, obviously you've done a lot of international work. So I would love if you could clarify that and thank you in advance. Sure, Justin, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, and, and partly this is my being a psychologist and needing to reserve trauma to describe certain things. There are many hard things in life. There are many painful things that happen to people that don't give them flashbacks or mobilize them uh, or give them uncontrolled, uh, uncontrollable anxiety. So let me, let me 
let me for a moment uh, uh, say my ideas in part come from a paper written by a colleague of mine named Giuseppe uh, Raviolo, who's a psychiatrist at Harvard. And he wrote a paper in the Psychiatric Times with a colleague saying he objected in the early going of the pandemic to saying all health professionals were traumatized by the pandemic and having to work with patients who had COVID and with overflowing ICUs and stuff like that. And you read that in the media. Everybody was traumatized by it. He said, when people are getting up every day, when health professionals are getting up every day and going into the hospital and taking care of patients and going home and coming back the next day and taking care of patients and doing it for weeks and months at a time, to say they've all been traumatized is glib. These are people who are operating at an extraordinarily high level. They, they are, are responding with enormous courage and energy and dedication. And to say, well, they've just been traumatized is glib and, 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 and it's pop psychology, it's media psychology. Do I believe that there are some things that have been extraordinarily painful in this pandemic, I do. Do I think there are things that are extraordinarily painful in this country for people of color? I do. Have I ever seen kids who've been bullied by teachers and it's overwhelmed them? I've seen that in my career. I saw it as a boy in schools. So I've seen the things you talk about, but there's, uh, I object to, uh, a, a tossing, saying they're all traumatized because many of these people to whom very painful things have happened have in fact responded with courage and energy and adaptability and they've started to fight for social justice and, and, and they responded not by becoming suicidal but becoming social activists. And I, I so I don't use trauma uh, in, in, in quite the way. I don't want it to be the only word we use to describe hurt and pain of a psychological nature. Did, did I make myself clear? Thank you, I appreciate it. Michael, I um, think you wanted me to, to um, go down to Alex's question on um, remote learning. So yeah. regarding the subject of remote learning, what have you seen that makes it accessible and supportive for students? It's, what it's brutal. You... It's really hard. <laughs> one, seventh grade, one seventh grade boy said to me, my parents have no idea how hard it is for me to sit and look at a teacher on a screen in a little square for hour after hour after hour. And I That's thought, helpful. yeah. What's helpful from educators and school administrators? Well, uh, 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 teachers have knocked themselves out to uh, get videos, bring things on YouTube. Uh, uh, I, I talked to a physics teacher and uh, a, a man who taught physics in the upper school and taught uh, uh, middle school kids. And, and, and he said, my whole career has been to put everything in lab experiments to teach science all standing, all in lab, and now I have to go remote. And I mean, he teared up. It was so hard for him to do. He's a man closer to age than me, and he didn't feel like he was a technical, technically gifted. But he worked for months to try and make his lessons entertaining, to access uh, uh, videos, to just to send some things home so kids could do uh, experiments in their home. Though he did point out you can't, you can't send hydrochloric acid home to middle schoolers uh, mm -hmm. to play with in their kitchen. I thought that seemed reasonable. There are limits uh, on the science experiments you can have a kid do at home. But uh, uh, the teachers themselves have had to try and be entertaining. And I had a second grade teacher in her 60s say, when she knew she had to teach remotely, um, just lay on the couch and sob because she just said, I, I'm too old, I can't do it. And I said, so what happened? What happened? And she said, well, I got a young IT person at the school and he helped me. And 
and I turned out to be a little more creative than I thought it was. And a lot of teachers have discovered a lot of their own creativity in, in, in this area, and some have not done well with it. And some classroom teachers who are gifted in the classroom haven't translated as well to remote. And some teachers um, who, who might not have been uh, quite as sterling in the classroom have turned out uh, uh, to be quite good on remote. But what I know is all teachers, and I have enormous respect for teachers, all teachers have been trying to make their remote uh, lessons as accessible as cogent and as entertaining as they possibly can. Um, but it's been tough and they don't always succeed. And I've had hundreds, literally hundreds of teachers say to me during this pandemic, the most painful thing for them is feeling that they were, they used to be a pretty darn good teacher, but Zoom makes them feel like they're just kind of mediocre, that they're not having the impact that they wish they could on kids. So they're trying, but it's hard. This is it's a hard. This is a hard medium to really affect the whole child as a learner. It's just hard. So um, the next question, Michael, is a little bit about um, talking to um, children about situations that are different. For instance, um, how about the kid who has relocated and left one parent behind due to a divorce or plus, plus a pandemic? Um, how can I, as a custodial, as a non-custodial parent, talk to them? Um, I don't know the age of the child. Everything, the conversations with children depend on age. But what you want to do is be as simple and as direct at, at the appropriate age level. So if you're a non-custodial parent and you want to talk about the distance between you and your child or the family arrangement, you say uh, 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 to you, your seven-year-old or your eight-year-old, you know, I wanna talk about the family. Do you have worries about um, that we live apart? And you ask a question and you see what the child does with it. And, um, and you've asked, what worries do you have? And, um, but you got to that question very quickly because the child begins to speak and then you can hear the level of the child's understanding and the sophistication of their own language. And you'll be able to tell, maybe even in a Zoom call, the fear in their face. And you can say, no, no, I, it's okay to talk to me about this. I need to know. But don't, not paragraphs. Kids don't, parents, it's not effective to talk to kids paragraphs. They're, 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 their eyes glaze over. Uh, we are the most important people in the world to them, but that doesn't mean they want paragraphs of explanation or, or paragraphs of, uh, of, of questions. Simple question, find out what the child's understanding is and whether the child is sharing your worry at whatever age. Uh, older, of course, you can go deeper and, 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 and have a more complex discussion, but that's just having to do with the maturity of the child. And, and, and you'll know that when they answer the question, anything you're worried about are living apart. Yeah, do you worry about this, how it's gonna affect our relationship? Because I worry about it. And then shut up and listen. Thank you. Um, I've heard that middle school, middle school teachers are noticing that students as a group are less mature yes. after the pandemic. Has yep. that been noticed more broadly? And every, in, so in every school, every yeah. school. The, I, 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 a school called me and they said, our, our ninth grade boys, they're so handsy. They're, their hands are all over each other. They're touching each other all the time. It's like they're seventh grade boys. And I said, well, they kind of are. <laughs> that with the social distancing, they didn't get to be as handsy as seventh grade boys are. Seventh grade boys are constantly bumping and pushing each other. Ninth grade boys, not so much. But if you socially distance boys for two years, they've, they've missed all of that kind of boy uh, 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 bumping stuff. And, and uh, so you're seeing it in ninth graders and it's out of place. 
and it's first annoying to the teachers and then uh, it gets under the skin and then they need to remember that these kids did miss something and they have to meet these kids where they are. But that means with empathy and expectation. Uh, but I have heard from so many schools, the ninth graders are a little more like eighth graders. The ninth grade boys are a little more like late seventh grade boys. The seventh grade boys are a little more like fifth graders. Well, the fifth graders are more like third graders. And the kindergartners are positively feral. They're just wild because they had no preschool and their parents were doting on them. And, and, and I was hearing it this afternoon um, uh, from my daughter in New Hampshire, who substituted by my grandson's teachers out because one of her kids has COVID and she has to quarantine with her child. And my daughter stepped in and she said, these kids are all like, and these uh, uh, pre-Kers are all like little entitled only children. No, I'm not doing that. Eh, bang, bang, boom, 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 like this. And they're not used to being in society. They're not used to being in preschool. They're a little unsocialized, but we'll get them there. Well, we don't punish them unduly for this, but they're, um, let me use a technical term. They're a little bratty um, because their parents have loved, loved them up and, and buffered them the way children do. But in any case, the children were at home, they weren't in society. And when you're in a pre-K classroom, you have to share the teacher's time, you have to share the playthings. And there are moments where adults say, we need to clean up, we need to do this, we need to do that. And uh, it takes training and socialization of kids to have them go along with this. And, um, and so they're just, they're just missing the training. It's the same way the boys at Belmont Hill, um, when, when we came back, we were uh, hybrid with that is we were in person four days a week and uh, 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 remote one day a week last year for much of it. And the homework loads were not what they had been. And the teachers at Belmont Hill began to say, these, these boys are out of shape. They're out of training. They're not used to. They're not used to doing this much work, um, and, and so their kids are out of practice. But that's not a mental illness; it's just a lack of training. Oh, independence um, is coming. Is that what? right? Their independence is coming. Well, they're. We have to call on them to be mature in a group and in a social setting, mm -hmm. and and we have to have expectations. We have, but we have to be empathic about why they come across as immature. But I'm hearing it everywhere. That's good. So um, one person did say um, that she wanted to share a book. Uh, she started reading about fears and worries that really helped um, with some anxiety. And I'm, I'm just relaying this message so that that person does share the book and then I can share it in the chat. Sure, um, please, what's the book? I don't know. Um, I'm, waiting for to see if that person shares it okay please <laughs> okay. Put, the, you put the title of the book i'll put the title of the book down when i when i do um with kiddos missing seasonal activities extracurricular at this time of pandemic we have observed increased disinterest in rejoining activities anew perhaps they are enjoying being at home and a more a little bit more lazy laugh out loud um, would you recommend going forth to sign up kids regardless and encourage kids to participate even when they don't seem very interested and dive back depends into getting involved? Depends on the age of the kid and, and how much they dig in. I don't believe, uh, um, you know, I had a friend who took her three daughters to uh, join swim teams. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, Michael, you're not gonna, you're not gonna approve of this, but I kind of pushed all three of them into the pool. And I said, I, I actually kind of do, I do approve of that. Did you make all three of them join the swim team? And she said, no, they all gave it a try and two said they didn't want to and one loved it. And so one stayed with it and I let the other two drop it. And to me, that's the right kind of parenting. You do push them in the pool and you do ask them to try it. but um, 
if you you can't want something more than your child wants at a certain point. And and sometimes parents say to me, you know, my my seven year old did little league for or eight year old did little league for four weeks and then he would he wanted to stop. And I said no, but you made a commitment. And I said, well, did he make a commitment? Who signed him up? He, he may have thought four weeks was a commitment. <laughs> I tried it. I did it for four weeks. I'm not interested. And then the parent says, well, but what if he does drops out again next year? I said, really, you're going to sign him up next <laughs> year? I mean, who's, who's making the commitment here, right? I mean, it's a dance. You have to in, try and enrich your child's life and you have to get them uh, to accept challenges. But to constantly push them for something that doesn't fit for them, it, 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 try and find something that fits. Okay. Um, how do you think at this point we should weigh in getting together with friends and family versus getting COVID? We haven't done much um, but of anything without masks in two years. What, do, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I may remind you I'm a psychologist, not a medical doctor. I just I don't want to give medical or public health, health advice. Uh, we're all struggling. We're all struggling with these decisions. But my wife and I don't get together with people unless they agree to do a rapid test. And then we just get together with another couple and we rapid test ourselves. I, but that's what makes us comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't, uh, there's the science, which you are all smart enough to read uh, about as well as I do, but I don't have any medical knowledge here. I can't. You, you have to find something that that works for you and your family. Okay, great. So um, how about the child uh, shows signs of arrested um, development and playing with younger siblings? How can we support moving their development forward? Well, playing with younger siblings when you're an older sibling is makes you feel mature and admired and respected and valued. Playing with younger kids is kind of terrific for older kids. And it makes them more empathic and it makes them into good caretakers. But what you're talking about is a child who then seems reluctant to play with her age mates, is that right? Um, and so she needs to be back in school with them and she may need to be in a summer day camp with her age mates, um, and but but you shouldn't feel critical of playing with younger siblings. That's pretty sweet stuff for the younger ones and the older. But you but you if you have a child who's avoiding uh, being with her peers, then put her in a some kind of uh, a program or camp session with uh, kids her own age. Okay, I, I think there's a number of questions here. I'm probably just going to go. The next one has to do with screens, and I think we've already addressed that. Um, does Dr. Thompson have any thoughts about the apparent increase in kids questioning their gender and identities lately? Do you? Oh, there's a small topic right towards the end. Yes. Look. The vast majority of kids um, think of themselves in binary terms. They accept the, the biological body they have. They're a natal girl or a natal boy and they accept that and their body and they live that life. There are kids who are um, uh, uh, never absolutely feel uh, uh, comfortable either because their sexual interests and orientation are um, different from the majority. The majority of kids are heterosexual um, and uh, a minority of kids are attracted to the same sex. And then there is a very tiny slice of kids um, who experience what's called gender dysphoria. And uh, they believe that they were born in the wrong body and, and they've gotten a, 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 a lot of support or by what's called affirmation theory. Uh, affirmation 
uh, of, of trans kids. It's a very tiny group of kids in, in numbers, but their suffering is real and, and they, they need attention to it. But the online conversation about it is, um, is pretty exciting. And so I, I was talking to a head of school from Alabama and he told me um, that the, his board chair at this private school in Alabama came to him and said, a third of the girls in seventh grade are saying they're lesbian. I want this to stop. <laughs> I.e., Mr. Head of School, put a stop to it. The seventh grade girls talking about sexuality in this way. Well, that's like stopping the tide. It's seventh grade girls. Um, uh, uh, the seven grade girls are becoming sexual, they're interested in it, and online, there are many more kids now. 20 years ago, it was almost unknown for a 14 year old girl to want to think of herself as a boy or want to be a boy, and now there are thousands who do. And there's no question in my mind that there's a some social contagion involved because these are exciting discussions they're upsetting for adults and they they create um uh the idea that kids can make themselves in a new way every generation of kids discovers their own sexuality believes they invented it their parents never had it or if they have three children they know that there's a technical issue they their parents had it three times but they, they, they want to uh, talk about sexuality in their own way. Every generation is excited by that. And fluidity is now part of that discussion. I think we'll have to see over time uh, what the percentages are of kids who are actually uh, uh, trans. But in the media, I, I think it's... Um, It's overblown, um, in my opinion, and that puts me on the conservative side of things. Um, but I, I just I go to schools that have kids who are transitioning, but it's very rare. It's very rare, and I recognize that there have always been, for instance, little boys who wanted to cross dress. I, I've been in schools, as Cindy said at the beginning, but for 50 years, there have always been little boys who wanted to play the girl roles, who wanted to cross dress, and who said they wanted to be a girl. And if you let them be, 90% of them grow up to be gay. And some grow up to be cross dressers. But they're letting you know they're different, whether they are actually trans and need a hormonal and ultimately a surgical. Uh, uh, a therapy uh, for their condition, I, 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 I question. I think the speed with which we are moving on this front is, it's a little alarming to me. I, um, so as I say, this makes me conservative in the, in the fluidity discussion, but it is very exciting to kids to think of themselves as fluid. And then I return back to what Sigmund Freud said about adolescence. Uh, he said they're all polymorphous perverse, which meant it was his way of saying they're attracted to everything, <laughs> right? Anything that moves is pretty sexually interesting for a 16 year old, <laughs> was Freud's view. Okay. I hope that answers your question. It, uh, well, I think you, you did answer the question. Um, so, why don't we, I'm, I'm thinking of winding up here and- Yeah, we, we blew look, past the 75 minutes, right? I well, don't know we, how did. we did, we did. We didn't lose a lot of people though. I'm we didn't lose, all right, well, that's good, all right. All right. <laughs> but are they really listening is the question. Okay, so listen, let's end with this one then. So the pandemic has affected the social development of a lot of kids. What can we do to help them? Are they asking for help? Oh, that's key. I don't know. Anybody um, want to raise their hand and have a, have something to say on that? 
please. So, so this is me. I didn't know how to raise the hand on this platform. So earlier you had the discussion about the ninth graders who act like seventh graders and so forth. And this is, this is kind of like an affirmation that the social development of the kids has been delayed due to the pandemic. And what can we do to help them? And I think um, you ask whether the kids are asking for help. Of course, they don't ask for help. Right? Yes. Have you seen a right. ninth grader that is acting like a seventh grader that is coming to you and asking? I How do I fix it? it? Yeah. So that, that's one question that I had. And I don't know if we have time for the second question about the screens, which is, Kids have moved because of the pandemic to interact on screens. Yes. So I wouldn't have allowed my kids to have Snapchat or put aside Snapchat, like big, be part of big chat groups on mobile before the pandemic, where while well, during the pandemic, I have allowed them and it's water under the bridge. They have made, they've already formed ways of interacting with friends via chat groups and so forth. And I can't take it back because that's the way they do. What are your thoughts about the interaction? Yes. So this is the two questions that I had. Okay. Um, the answer to the first one is to let them interact with other children in school settings and let their teachers uh, have expectations for their behavior and, and meet them where they are, but gradually lift their behavior back to, to where it's at mature ninth grade, I mean, normal ninth grade levels. Um, uh, uh, it, 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 I don't think there's anything you can do as a parent to manage your child's functioning in a group. There's very little you can do uh, because they don't want you. It would be seen as interfering. And in any case, the practice and they, it, it, they will, the group will get more mature if the school uh, 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 asks them to meet certain uh, uh, behavioral marks and they will all move together because they're much more influential with each other at that age than they are influenced by us. So the answer to the first one is just send them to camp, send them to school, let them, let them be held to account. Don't, don't buffer them or protect them. Let them held to, if, if, if they get in trouble for doing something socially immature, they have to uh, uh, face a consequence for it and, and, and get their act together. Um, I, I do believe that in-person uh, friendship, in-person crushes, in-person love relationships are better than on screen. Uh, and, and so as kids are together more, the screens will take, uh, 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 will occupy a smaller place. Your job as a parent is to make sure um, uh, that uh, if it's a younger child that you have some access to their online presence so you can check it if you've got an 11 year old or a 12 year old who's online you have to uh, uh, they can't have a password that locks you out you have to make sure that they're they're not taking their devices to bed so they get sleep and that's just good parenting um but clearly an online social life is now part of the american childhood and uh i think it uh i i think it's a losing battle to try and um, uh, prohibit it completely, but you can you can have some limits and boundaries. And again, Jenny, I don't know um, uh, the age of the kids uh, that you're talking about. So younger kids need more limits and more supervision. And older kids, if they have behaved in a trustworthy way, um, you gradually relax uh, the restrictions because their maturity uh, you, has demonstrated itself. You've seen that they, they can handle it. Um, I just wanted to note that I did put a note in the bottom of the chat to everyone. The name of that book is Helping Your Child with Fears and Worries, a self-help, whoops, just lost it. Um, hold on. It's a self-help guide for parents by Kathy, Creswell, C-A-T-H-Y, C-R-E-S-W-E-L, and Lucy Willits. So I just wanted you to know, everybody to know that. So, uh, I, Federico, I don't have the data that you're asking in, in, uh, in the difference between European and your U.S. I'm afraid I don't. Uh, uh, Federico asked a question about of different priorities in Europe. 
Thank you. Okay. Cindy, so we may have come to the end and we, 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 we did the whole 90 minutes and people, <laughs> stayed with, we, people kept their computers on and may have stayed with us. For those of you who kept your cameras on, I can't tell you how much it means to me to talk to people. So I appreciate it. I know it's a little exposing, but I it was good for the speaker. Huh? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for you, coming Michael. on. Thank you. And may Omicron get up and go. Leave us be as soon as possible. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Thank Colleen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. If you Thank want you to just get in, you can get in.